appreciate the invitation here, uh, especially uh, with all, with Bob Batterman, who we attend church together. And when uh, uh, we were talking, he was looking at some of my stuff, he suggested that we arrange to come over here, working out with Jim, and it worked real perfectly. So now, I'm going to follow a script so I won't talk for three hours. I, got, I want to keep it to 30 minutes. <laughs> Uh, my name is Frank Chambers. I was in World War II and in the Battle of the Bulge and other campaigns uh, in the European theater. And as I tell the kids, you know that as the ETO when you study history. I was born in 1923 in a farmhouse in Illinois. In those days, the doctor delivered babies in the homes, unless there was a medical emergency. I grew up in the 1930s in the era known as the Great Depression. Also in the Midwest, including Nebraska, we were experiencing the Dust Bowl. Very little rain in the 1930s. They called it the Dirty Thirties. The folks will tell you those. Remember that, right? Uh, uh, I remember those big clouds of dust. Even in Illinois, sometimes the sun would be blanked out. Just a little blob up there uh, when the dust was blowing from Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, and come across, and we, we got to see all of it. By the way, he's, a, he's giving you just a, a, an outline of my, my three years career, just some of the highlights. It's kind of a reminder for you. And my mother had to dust the furniture every day. Didn't have air conditioning in those days. Had to leave the uh, windows open, didn't you, to survive. So World War II really started in Europe in 1939, when Hitler and his Nazi armies took over almost all of Europe, except in England. And he tried to bomb London off the earth. I recall coming home from school in 1940, you know, you were 16, 17 years old. We turned on the radio, and I tell the kids, there was no TV or anything then. Turn on the radio, and you could hear the bombs dropping in London. And, you know, being 16, 17, you know, oh boy, what's that? Things don't look good. And, I mean, that was on our minds for sure, we have the, of our 90 years of age here, guys. I graduated from high school in 1941. There were 32 students, a big, big class, uh, and, and, a, and a farm school. I received a tuition to the University of Illinois to study agriculture. My father could pay my room rent. He said, I could get $40 a month together for your room rent. You got your tuition paid for, but you got to eat. So uh, as I tell the kids, if you're smart when you go to college, you get a job where they serve food. <laughs> you know I've had stuff come back and say that was some of the best advice I ever had. But I did. I washed dishes and washed the pots and pans. Then I asked the kids, let's go to 1941 again, December 7th. What happened? Boom. Pearl Harbor. Yes. With a surprise attack on that, on that Sunday morning. The next day, the U.S. declared war on Japan, Germany, and Italy. Germany and Italy had taken control of several European countries. Uh, beginning in 1939-1940. They were called the Axis powers. The U.S., Great Britain, France, Russia, and several smaller European countries were known as the Allies powers. That Sunday night uh, on December 7th, we did serve food in our rooming house. Uh, that was my night off. But I uh, had to eat, so I went over to the church of Vesper service, you know, where the kids would get together for them. And here I am walking across because just you know, a few hours earlier, one of my buddies had come down the back steps of our rooming house and said, did you hear the news? They dropped a bomb on Pearl Harbor. Well, we had to think a minute where Pearl Harbor was. That was a common word in those days, in the 40s. Oh, and he says, and they're, they're, the Japanese are going to come over and attack us on the west coast. Rumors, you know. I was walking to the cross that night, and it was kind of misty and that. And you know how your mind and just all sorts of things, I could hear bombers coming over. But it was, but you know, I thought I heard a plane. Got there and, talk, and we, we shared this. I did hear a plane. Uh, uh, the, uh, there's an air base that should have field. It was just a few miles from the campus. So there was a plane coming in. I didn't, you know, that, that preserved my sanity a little bit. <laughs> With the, uh, with the declaration of uh, war on December 8th, every male 18 years and old had to then, because earlier we had to report for the selective service of the draft. Then I remember when they were drawing out for that, 
for that. They, went, they had a big fishbowl. In fact, I went on the internet and found that picture where they reached in the fishbowl and bought out that first number of a, of a person. Like that. And then uh, they, the kid said, well, how did you put them in the computer? I said, hey, we didn't have computers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they can't imagine the end working with us. So we were assigned a draft number. The, uh, I was able to complete three semesters at the university until my number was called. My dad, I said, what should I do? He says, you just wait and let, uh, let him come and uh, get you. Because all my buddies were, were volunteering for different things. He says, well, because in his experience in World War I, which I'll relate in a minute. So I was in the ROTC at the university, and I was training, uh, they were training me on the 105 howitzer, the four inch gun, you know, shoot for six or seven miles. You know, that's a good place to be, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was sent to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, the big artillery school, the, the biggest in the world, where they still to be trained in the artillery. The 105 millimeter howitzer. It was pulled, towed, and, uh, by, and eventually that famous Jimmy, the GMC deuce and a half, two and a half ton truck, uh, that uh, was that practically saved my life. So that, that was a pull. Uh, we talk about that famous Jimmy. Uh, Patton said it was a workhorse of the Army. Of course, he liked it because it brought him all that gasoline to keep his tanks going. It's the Red Ball Express that you all heard about. In fact, I was on that for about a week. That was a that was a, a challenge, and uh, you, you know on those Jimmy trucks they made about eight hundred thousand of those. And they used them in Korea, and some in Vietnam I think, and maybe you can find a few souvenirs left around today because that that was something. I uh, upon completion of my artillery basic training in Fort Sill, they said we need engineers. So we're going to have to rebuild Europe and the world afterwards. So you're, you had three semesters of college. Uh, you ought to be an engineer. Here's a test. You, you, you take it. Well, I passed it. I say about 10% of us did. And uh, they call it the Army Specialized Training. And you'll see it on my uh, collection over there. It's a, it's a lab of learning with a sword running through it. Kind of, kind of interesting. <laughs> to become an Army engineer. And they sent us to a school. See, the Army rented a whole bunch of, Army and Navy rented a lot of colleges uh, in World War II because they didn't have a lot of students. And this happened to be a Catholic boys school in Wisconsin. They didn't have any students except one or two that, uh, uh, I think he had flat feet or something. And so uh, I was in, in engineering training. About four months along, they said, you know, the rumor got out that we don't need any engineers. We've changed our program. <coughs> okay. So, uh, four of us heard that rumor, and we ran down, enlisted, and passed the Army Air Corps exam as an aviation cadet. And they said, we're going to beat them. So, they sent us uh, out to Huntington, West Virginia, to Marshall College that they'd rented to for uh, flight training, uh, pre-flight training and all that. Out there, about five months. You guess it. We don't need any more pilots. We don't. Need, we we we're going to need a lot of ground people, ground forces, and so forth. So they closed out. Uh, back on the ASTP, they closed out, uh, closed out 73,000 on there and sent them back. On the cadets, they closed out 35,000 of us and sent us to. Uh, uh, to the, well, we had come in class that afternoon about five o'clock, and they said, "Turn in all your supplies at the." in the supply room, which was the, gy the gymnasium. By midnight, we were on a train, not knowing where we were going. Talk about a feeling. <laughs> Here I had all this cadet uh, uniform on, you know, and they were pretty classy. I ended up the next morning down in Kentucky. I woke up and there I was at an infantry division in Kentucky that had just come off of maneuvers, and they were scraping mud off of everything. They saw my outfit on, that first started, get out of that uniform right now! And I was in khakis real fast, I'll tell you. So then he looked at it and said, oh, artillery. Well, we got an artillery outfit. And we'll send you down there. Don't know what they'll do with you. And I said, I'll gladly go down there because many of my buddies were going to the rifle companies as replacements. Because they knew they were getting ready to invade Europe soon. So I got down there and the, the, the motor sergeant said, can you drive? Yeah, I sure can. Farm boy, okay, because you know a lot of the city boys didn't even have driver's license in those days. They lived in the city where they just rode the public transportation and never had a car or anything. So 
that was my connection. I said that was the right place to be uh, in the Army. Uh, our training became quite intense uh, since the invasion of Europe was rumored. D-Day, we know it as. See, now it's, it's April, and this is, uh, you can see the time. We figured we we're, were all going to get ready. We're going to be in on D-Day. We work up, uh, woke up on the morning of June the 6th, 1944, came out with the loudspeaker. The Allies have landed in Europe, in, uh, in Normandy or France, he said. The invasion of Europe has begun. We said, wow, we missed that one. <laughs> but they'll probably need us for a few more invasions. Well, Patton took care of some of those invasions, didn't he? When he went across France and France, <laughs> well, he's had fuel and, <coughs> and that. So, okay, so they uh, trained us now. Uh, as I said, our 75th was not battle ready, so uh, we weren't shipped out. But we didn't leave New York Harbor uh, until November of 1944. Because they said, we're going to, as we're talking about us, we're going to send you over because it's about over. Hitler doesn't have anything left. Uh, he doesn't have any plane, fuel, uh, and stuff like that. He'll probably be over by Christmas. But you're going over there to relieve those guys that have been there since D Day, which was reasonable. Oh, okay, we'll do that. So we landed on Harv on December 10. See the time limit? We were sitting there in the mud of, of uh, north of Paris, and when it broke loose up in <coughs> Belgium, the Battle of the Bulge had begun. Hitler said, I guess the advice of all of his generals and everything, I'm going to fix those guys yet. So he brought everything he could scrape together in Europe and, and Germany and all that, and brought it over and hid it under the clouds and fog and so forth of, of, uh, over in the border, and he broke through on December 16th, which became the Battle of the Bulge. His idea was to break through real fast and get to Antwerp. And then that, that the British and the Canadians were on the north, the Americans on the south, and, and maybe, they, maybe I can preserve my country, because he knew he was defeated. Well, of course, that didn't last. They didn't take any fuel with them. They didn't take any uh, bridge-building equipment with them. And so uh, here are some green GIs, 18 and 19, 17, 18, 19 years old, that have been put in as replacements, like my buddies were. And in about two days, they figured this thing out. Uh, as these tanks, uh, Hitler's tanks started to go through these little belts and villages, they would hide in the, uh, the basement of a, a home that, where you could see out the basement window and shoot out that first tank, the, the idler wheels, not the front, the idler wheels. And they would stop that tank. That stopped every tank behind them, see? And they used up all their gasoline. And that, in about three days, they had the bulge, the bulge blunted just that way for those kids that we owe everything to them. Well, so by Christmas Eve, we, they had run us up north and uh, to, to blunt that. We got our, order, our marching orders to get up there real fast. So Christmas Eve, we fired our first shots. And, uh, uh, just a sidelight, on New Year's Eve, we had a party. Every cannon in our outfit fired three shots into the German lines at midnight. Uh -huh. That was our Hitler's New Year's Eve. <laughs> that was the biggest noise I ever heard at one time in my life. I wondered, but there's some German soldiers had headaches the next day for sure. And, okay, so uh, now the Allied forces passed Hitler's troops out of the Ardennes and back into Germany by January 25th. Now, but there's a lot happened in between that. It snowed, it got below zero, uh, and our, our troops, uh, uh, their boots and stuff were down in the warehouses around Paris someplace because they didn't think they'd ever need them. See, they thought everything was over. And so, uh, they, they, as one of you guys said there, that, that your family said, yeah, they got their boots about made. Which is right, after we, did, after we got all our winter here after we didn't need it. Anyhow, me driving this truck, I want to have a little story on that that was in the, the news story. Uh, I was so fortunate in this Jimmy truck. Uh, it, it had a CO cab on it. It was a, a civilian truck uh, reconfigured for military purposes. I have pictures of it over here. They, uh, uh, and then they put a front wheel drive on it and dual axles on it, you know, that so it became a six by six. Uh, that. And uh, I would take my steel helmet and put it in the cab of my truck, and, it, and the kids said, you have heaters in it? No, oh, heaters in it. I made my own heater. I put my k ration, my wax box in there, and it would burn with no smoke, and I had heat. 
Then I would take my beans and soup and I'd put them on the manifold of that, that, that six-cylinder <laughs> truck. I had hot food. And uh, as the story says, I had real hot food one day when a can of beans exploded. <laughs> <laughs> I had the office steak for about two weeks to that, to, to that burned off, I'll tell you. No, a little side light like that. It's just really, really what, what make the world go round, don't they? Okay. So now, uh, and uh, I, I have pictures of, uh, of our 75th division and the guys digging in and all that. And it was bitter, bitter, bitter cold. We lost more guys with the frozen peak frostbite than that than we did by entries on that. Uh, now, so we said, uh, okay. Hitler's groups are back across the Rhine River, down to the Siegfried Line. Uh, now we're okay. We can sit here. And about 24 hours later, they said, 75, we got a job for you. The French are having trouble down in, uh, around Colmar, down south. We need you down there. So our division hit, hitched up 1,400 of us in our trucks and jeeps and air, air command cars. We started for uh, Colmar, for southeast France. And we uh, drove day and night. Another seven, uh, there were 7,000 carried on the trucks. Another 7,000 of our guys went by the 40 and 8. You've heard about those. Uh, 40 men and 8 horses from World War I. They used the same cars from World War II. They hadn't changed them a bit. And so they got out there. And so then in uh, late, late, very late uh, January, uh, we were down joining the French Army. That was a trip, I'll tell you. Couldn't use a black. I couldn't use lights really, of course. So our caravan, and it, it's the Bosch's Mountains, if you know that part of France, really tough mountain country. We would drive along. I would. I'd be following that little two-inch light ahead of me, and that was a, a experience too. The, uh, that blackout light, and as I said in the story, it's just like a herd of elephants. You see, they're driving long, you know, tail to head, uh, like that, to following each other. And you know we made that without a single mishap. Everybody got out. I don't know how we did it. Because I looked down on my driver's side and I couldn't hardly see the bottom. Because it was hundreds and hundreds of feet down there. Looked over on the, the passenger side, nothing but a solid wall of rock on this little narrow road where we're all traveling on. And, and we made it. And I say that was the experience. But as I say, 1,400 vehicles, 7,000 soldiers and all that. On January 29th, we, uh, 1945, we assembled near Rubyville in Alsace province. Our 75th was attached to the French First Army. We had been there just a few hours until here come a bomb right into our headquarters. I guess that was a greeting that they were sending us. They knew we were there. And then a short time later, a jet plane went over, the first one I'd ever seen. In fact, it went over before I even heard it. That, you know, in those days, something like that would come and uh, it beat the sound when it uh, came around as, as he was strafing us going through there. So that was my introduction to, to that. And uh, so I say we were back in a war zone. Our mission was to drive Hitler's troops out of the Colmar area and push them back over the Rhine River. We saw several days of house to house and mud hole to mud hole uh, combat. We had traded the snow and coal of the Ardennes for the mud of Alsace. So it was really challenging to get my gun in position, because that's what I would do. I put that, uh, back that gun in, they put a camouflage head over quick, very quickly, then get my truck out of there and we'd hide it too, so, and so I had to get him in position. Finally, on February 7, 1945, my 75th crossed the rhine Rhone Canal and pushed the, and reached the Rhine River. Mission accomplished. The enemy had again been driven from French soil. Uh, and then, as I say, this campaign, what qualified me, this part of it, for the uh, French Legion of Honor that I'll pass. Bob, it's right there. If you want to start it down your table, it would be real fine uh, with me. Uh, if you could uh, you just pass it on and they could take it from one to the other. Uh, as I say, Napoleon established that in, in 1802 and uh, gave it to his military and other people and that. And just a few years ago, the French government says, you know, we really never recognize those Americans. And, you know, there, there's not a lot of them. 16,000 of us in World War II, there's what, less than 2,000 of us left in total today. And so we better get some uh, awards going to them while, uh, uh, while uh, they're still alive. And so I applied for that. And uh, the Chicago office, uh, Chicago Embassy awarded to me 
But they said, you've got to come to Chicago to get it. And I said, you know, I'm going to be in Houston over Christmas where my family lives. My son-in-law works down at NASA, and, and I said that. So we sent it down to Houston, and they gave me the award on uh, December 30th, this mm -hmm. past year, with the French Council. And, okay, uh, we'll have some pictures. I want, I want to move along. You know, while I was down, uh, since I've done my work on the internet, you know, I've learned more about World War II on the internet than I knew the day when I was there. <laughs> I didn't know what was happening two miles down the road. For us. And so uh, that's been a great boon to, be, to to put a lot of this together. I since learned that just a few miles away when we were down in, uh, in Alsace, the famous Audie Murphy had been making history. His, he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor while fighting with the third American Division, American Third Division, that was right along beside us. Audie Murphy became the most decorated American soldier in World War II. He's now rest in Arlington Cemetery. If you've ever been to Arlington and walk up that path to the tomb of the unknown, you go right by Audie's little uh, tombstone. Look just like everybody else's, right there on the path. With the Colmar pocket that wrapped up, the, our 75th received orders to retrace our steps and travel back up to Holland, because we've got a big Rhine crossing going to happen up there. The Rhine River crossing uh, was to be uh, executed in a few, few weeks. The delay was caused by the, the melting of that heavy snow and the flooding up in the Ardennes, so they had to wait till the river went down before we could get our pontoon bridges on. As we conveyed north, we again passed through Nancy, France. The name of the city brought back many memories to me. My father was a veteran of the first war. It was, we, didn't, we didn't have a World War I yet then. It was the big war. That was the big war, the first war, the big war. And uh, he was stationed near Nancy in a balloon observation unit. You know, uh, send a couple of guys up in the gondola of a balloon with their binoculars, they see what the Germans do. Then you bring them down real fast before the Red Baron shoots them down or something like that. You know? <laughs> that was his job. He drove a truck. The truck had to pull that balloon. He had that steel cable that was tethered to that, that balloon all the way. You know what my dad told me? When I, I can remember 10, 12, 13 years old, he said, this is when things were starting to kind of warm up in Europe, you know, Hitler was doing a little bit around there in the, the mid-30s. He says, it's not over yet. We didn't finish the job. You will be back over there. He says, they're in such poor condition in Germany because of the reparations and everything they had to pay. Inflation is so bad. He says, his, uh, his description, I saw housewives, German housewives, with a wheelbarrow full of German marks going to the store to buy a loaf of bread. That was his analogy of, of the uh, inflation and everything like that. And so uh, we, we know the story of it. The German people, they grabbed for anything like that. They would give them food and, and show them. Okay. Now, one last event while I was on French soil. We passed uh, through Lunaville, no Nancy, for a rest stop, an r, &R for a few days. The most wonderful thing happened. We were at an Army Quartermaster bath unit. We all got to shower, and believe it or not, we were issued clean clothes. These was our first shower and our first clean clothes in 60 days. Imagine, two months with no bath and wearing the same clothes. He said, thank goodness. The weather was cool. I was. I will not describe our before showers physical appearance except to say that, thank goodness, the temperature was cool most of the time. It was a event that I shall never forget. One side light, even in the in that in the cold Ardennes, we had to make sure we were clean shaven. Now shaving in cold water out of a helmet was an experience too for a 21 year old face, you know. But uh, that was part of the discipline to be clean shaven all the time. Now we could do it, where some of those poor uh, GIs couldn't do it until the riflemen, but that was uh, our, our discipline. After VE Day in uh, Europe, May the 8th, I was assigned to the beautiful uh, Champagne country near Reims, France. Our job at, at our camp in New York, at Camp New York in the Assembly Area Command was to deploy all the troops from Europe theater, from the European theater to the Pacific theater of operations. That war was not resolved until August 1945. I left French Soil in January to return to the States for discharge. Now, just before, uh, in August, uh, they uh, said, we're going to offer some uh, leaves, a couple of weeks, uh, some furlough, some leaves. 
you can either go to the French Riviera or to Switzerland. But the guy said, they're going to the Riviera, that's where the girls are. <laughs> I said, you know, I'd like to go to Switzerland. I, I hear they make watches up there. I want to get my folks some watches. So I still got the watch. I thought, oh, my dad, I'm in Switzerland. We were in, the, uh, in one of those beautiful chateaus on the side of the tallest mountain in Switzerland there in that day in August when one of our buddies kept crashing into the door. Hey, guys, did you hear the news? They dropped a bomb on Japan as strong as 20,000 tons of dynamite. That was my introduction to the atom bomb. Of course, you know the rest of the story. It moved along pretty fast after that. Then we had to have points to come home on because they started the rotation. And so uh, that by combat empty vanity, and those things got me a lot of points. But I didn't have enough points to get home until January 1946. I, uh, I mentioned that, you know, that the uh, 15 million uh, men and women in World War II today, they're probably the age of 95 or, or more. At 90, I'm a kid as far as that, that, that group is concerned. Uh, now, I, I encourage the young people, if they have great grandpas and anybody in their family that's in the service, regardless of their service, get them to talk about it. Write it down. That, now, I say, Grandpa might not talk about it much the first time. You say, oh, I don't know anything about that. I, I don't remember. But then about the two weeks later, you see Grandpa say, you know, you mentioned that the other day. I happen to think of something. <laughs> and Grandpa almost continually start to think of something. I didn't think of something until <laughs> my, uh, my grandson, my oldest grandson, was in the eighth grade. And he says, Grandpa, did you see any of those buzz bombs? And I said, he said, what were they? Because they were studying them in social studies. And I said, well, it was nothing but a flying bomb with a little wings on it. It had a little uh, jet propulsion thing on top. And they would fill it full of fuel. And if they wanted to hit London, they'd fill it full. If they wanted to hit us halfway to London, put a half a tank in. And it came down. And I said, uh, we, uh, we went to, uh, we'd hear it coming. It'd be about 1,000 feet high, and especially at night. Put, 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 you know, that little promotion jet. And we'd say, bye, but if it was coming here, put, and no more puts. One thing to do, find a hole. Because <laughs> <laughs> that thing was going to really dig a, dig a deep, dig a deep hole, and I'll tell you, a, a, an immense hole on it. And so, and, and uh, as I tell the high schoolers, you know who developed that? Werner Brown Brown, who we captured before the Russians got him. So he came over and built all, uh, designed our jet propulsion stuff on that. So that, that, that was a, he, he was the author of that, I mean, the developer of that as well. Now, I'm going to close this now. Yes, I'm trying to close it. Uh, I, had, I had some very memorable experiences, uh, of course, and uh, you try to pick out those that mean something, but the one of mine, well, the first one I want to talk about, just a second, is that night where they said, we're heading up north, and we got, and we're blackout, and as we got close, further up into Belgium, driving blackout, we saw, I saw lightning. Oh, it's December. That can't be lightning. We were seeing the flashes of the gunfire, you know, from the, from the front. And you know what went through my mind? What in the world am I getting into? I truly, I tell you, was scared. I found out later when I, after a few hours, my jacket and coat, I was just soaked, uh, just from that. Just pure fear, because I remember seeing the World War I story, movies, you know, uh, all quiet on the Western Front and all those kind of things, and, and the flash, that's what we were seeing. Then I, we got close enough, we could hear things, it really got serious. <coughs> and we woke up the next morning, we were guarding millions of gallons of gasoline, so that uh, Hitler's uh, tanks didn't come up that road and, and get to those millions of gallons of gasoline. Uh, another uh, event, uh, one day, uh, and after the snow uh, act, uh, had kind of settled down and so forth, a general drove his jeep in to our, where our, we had our trucks and went up to, says, it's, it's one star general, who's in charge here? And so the motor sergeant stepped in, I need three trucks. Uh, Chambers, you're one of them, go, follow me. Well, you didn't know where we were going. You know where we ended up? Alongside the road where all of our guys had been killed out in the field. And they were, uh, about a week or so before, and it snowed off. When I first saw them, I thought it was little stacks of hay, you know, like you see out in the field. And so we uh, and went out and carefully picked these fellows up. 
And you know what I always was afraid of? I'd pick up somebody I knew. I always got to your mind. Then. Okay, now the last one I want to close on. It's of human interest. For a few weeks, we were in the Army of Occupation in Germany. And uh, we were in this German town, and of course, we were in charge. Mainly, we were in charge of the brewery. We had to guard the brewery against our guys as well as anybody else. But the Germans kept the brewery going. Oh, gosh. And the Americans made sure the brewery stayed working, too. So that was one of our assignments, to guard the brewery. Uh, the brewery. But then we'd have to eat. So we would, uh, it was nice weather. It was great. And we put our uh, tables out on the saw horses out in the middle of the street. And then the, the cook would come along, and you'd walk along with your mess kit, and the, your aluminum mess kit, your two-part mess kit, and your coffee canteen. And he would, you'd hold, he'd slop the potatoes and gravy on top of beans and some meat and anything else they had on there. And you had a bunch of stuff piled up in there. And uh, then you ate it. And then you had to uh, go dispose of it down in a barrel and then dip your uh, canteen and uh, everything in its uh, scald, uh, boiling water, scalding water, so you wouldn't get dysentery. That was so critical on that. And uh, so we do that. However, when I started down that day to that big barrel that was, uh, say, uh, 50 feet on at the end of the line, to dump that stuff I had left in mine, here were three little German children with their bucket, looking up at you with those little eyes, begging you to put your scraps in their buckets. That got to me, guys. And I said, then I never want my children, my grandchildren, anybody else's children to ever have to go through something like that. That really brings it home. So that's what I, and I share this, and you get some pretty serious High school students, when I tell this to them too, you know, because I, I, I want to make that point with them. How we veterans feel about war and that. And that we, well, it's necessary to have the strong defense and everything. We hope we never have to use it. I think that concludes. <coughs> and I'm, I'm over time, five minutes. Perfect. Thank you, Frank. And so, some time for question and answer. Yes. Let, let's open it up. Yes. Uh, you ever been back? Yes. I'm glad you asked that. I went back in 1999 with a military group, military tour group. None of my buddies were with me at that time, but other guys that we'd been in the same general area. <coughs> I went back and I found that <coughs> I found. Uh, see, we're, we were had uh, uh, we had those 105 howitzers, you know, uh, uh, cannons, shells. And they were boxes about this long. And all I went back and I found where we were. I found the, uh, the handles on them. And uh, the wood had all rotted 99 years later, you know, under the Ardennes, the forest uh, protection uh, and all that. And so, please set that down. Okay, thanks. And uh, another thing I brought along was uh, this is the uh, New Testament that my father carried in World War I. And I carried it with me all, all through World War II. Uh, also, uh, while I was, I, but now I remember driving down that certain road, so I picked up a rock on that road that I drove down. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, there, and here, a friend of mine had been uh, to visit the uh, cemetery at Normandy and all that. He brought back this for me to, to have it in my collection too. So I've never been to Normandy, but this, this rock came from, uh, from the Normandy shores. This one? Uh, oh, this uh, you can send this down. But that's the uh, that's the official certificate that goes with that uh, that award. And see, yeah. So we went back and they say we found where we've been and uh, and found a, a communication wire because it was plastic and, and that and we had the, uh, back there. Now, I, I, seventy years this year is the Battle of Lawrence. My daughter, she she really is into this. I mean. She's a member of our association of the Battle of the Bulls and all that. And uh, she, we, we talked about going back. I don't know if I want to be there in December or not. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but she said, you know, we could go. And she said, uh, next year, maybe uh, with our grandson and all those, that uh, maybe we could get a family. Because I always had the idea of running a big van and taking my family and visiting these places. OK, any other questions? 
not seen lots of uh, shows on the History Channel and the Military Channel about World War II, and boy, nothing compares with listening firsthand uh, from people who were there. So thank you very much, Frank. It's, uh, a little token of our appreciation. I've got the uh, Dedalian LeMay flight commemorative coin I'd like to thank give you. Thank you. Thank you. To uh, maybe remember your visit with us. All right. That will go in my, my collection. Next time I open up my frame, I'll put it in there. <laughs> thank you. They said, what, the, what am I going to do with my Legion of Honor? I, I'll probably put it in the vault in the safe and, uh, and keep it that way. Oh, thank you so much. This is, uh, I shall always remember. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Flight Captain. Mr. Provost Martin. Sir, I propose a joke. Our distinguished visitors from the greatest generation. Here, here, here. Thank you.